Thank you, Chair. I think the Chair wanted me to introduce myself initially because my last name is too complicated to pronounce. <laughs> it's okay, I get that a lot. Uh, my name is Johannes uh, Gabrasadik. I'm a research fellow uh, for a research project that's been conducted by uh, UNU Wider and Massachusetts Institute of Technology. My background is civil engineering. Uh, majoring in uh, water resources engineering. I did my PhD at Colorado University uh, in water resource uh, management. My research topic is in climate change, uh, water resources modeling, and in recent years, uh, the renewable resource and integration of uh, different renewable resources. Today, I'm gonna be talking about one of the research uh, that we've conducted uh, couple of years ago about uh, integration of hydropower and an intermittent uh, renewable energy resource, uh, wind and solar, to, uh, to c provide a regional integration of energy production. <clears throat> uh, okay, so I think everybody knows renewable energy resources uh, such as wind, hydropower and solar uh, are uh, playing major role uh, in providing affordable, uh, low-cost and reliable energy resources. Uh, they've also been very uh, effective in uh, reducing uh, the utilization of um, fossil fuels such as coal uh, by, uh, by providing environmentally friendly and clean energy source. For this reason, uh, they've, been, uh, they've been playing a central role in, in, uh, in combating climate change. For this reason, many countries are actively engaged in, uh, uh, in, in increasing the role of these renewable resources, particularly wind and solar, into, into the energy system. On, um, on the right chart here shows the growth of uh, wind uh, capacity from 1996 to 2014, you can see that there is an exponential growth uh, in, in the capacity uh, starting from uh, 61 to uh, end of 2014, reaching about 370 gigawatt hour, a uh, gigawatt, sorry, uh, which has been installed uh, for about over 90 countries at the moment. And this number is expected uh, to grow to uh, 2,000 gigawatts by 2040. So this exponential growth is going to continue. Uh, similarly for solar, uh, by end of 2013, some reports have uh, 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 indicated a number 142 gigawatt hour, which is also going to grow to uh, 5,600 gigawatt by 2050. Uh, so if we look at the capacity uh, of these renewable resources in South Africa, uh, this map here shows the solar uh, potential uh, globally. Uh, you can see South Africa is one of the hotspot areas uh, along with Mexico and Brazil and has been labeled as one of the, mo uh, the most exciting place for further development of solar. Also for wind, there's a, a enormous potential for onshore and offshore development in, in South Africa. Uh, so for this reason, the government of South Africa is planning to aggressively engage in developing these resources to increase the penetration of uh, their share of uh, contribution into the, the, the energy system. So this report, uh, the uh, Integrated Resource Plan Study, uh, initiated by the Department of Energy in 2011, uh, 11, uh, 10 and 11, uh, states about 21% per of penetration can be achieved uh, uh, through the involvement of wind and, uh, and solar by 2013. And these are other figures from other studies like the WWF vision by 2013 uh, comes up uh, with 37% of penetration by 2040 uh, and even a more optimistic um, and aggressive green scenarios by ESCOM by 2040, uh, about 41% of penetration can be achieved. Uh, looking at this, this, the distribution of uh, uh, the energy from the IRP uh, report, we can see that uh, coal will still be the major contributor to the energy system, amounting to 46%. Uh, however, the wind and uh, solar contribution will still amount to a, to a significant portion uh, during this time. So these, these figures, person, I personally believe that these figures might be a bit ambitious for the reason that I will I will discuss in the following slides. Um, 
So um, while these renewable resources are highly attractive because they present us with many socioeconomic and environmental benefits, uh, there is a challenge uh, when we come to implementation. So one of the major challenges, particularly for wind and solar, is the fact that they are highly intermittent. This is a sample uh, wind generating capacity for a day. You can see that it's fluctuation. It's, uh, it's fluctuating uh, to, from zero to the maximum capacity within, within a while. Uh, matter of hours or even minutes sometimes. So it's really, uh, it's really unpredictable. It's just fluctuates and highly intermittent. Uh, this is a power duration curve to see, uh, sort of to, indi to indicate the reliability. So even though the capacity is really high, uh, you can see that at high reliability, it's, it, it can go uh, to a lower value. So this is a plot between capacity and percentage of time that this resource is available. So looking at 60% of, of the time, we can only rely at uh, 5,000 megawatt hour. And if we go to higher reliability, which is mostly what we need for the energy system, like 90%, it almost goes down to uh, 1,000 megawatt hour. So even though the maximum capacity is really high, it's, it's a huge challenge. This intermittency brings a huge challenge in terms of implementation. Uh, the other challenge is the fact that it's non-dispatchable, which means we have uh, very little or no control on how to how we are going to generate the energy. For example, if we look at hydropower, we can shut off the reservoirs and store energy as a form of uh, store energy as a form of water uh, when we don't need the when, when the demand is low or when we don't need the energy. But we can't do that for wind. It's pretty much generate while the wind is blowing. But if the wind is uh, not there, we're we're out of luck. Um, so the mostly an effective way to make this um, intermittent resource more usable is by using a complementary res energy resource or other non-dispatchable uh, non en energy resource such as hydropower. How it works is the hydropower uh, uh, dams can serve as you may call it a battery, like to save energy while the wind is blowing or while the wind uh, the wind energy is available. Uh, and whenever the wind is, is not available, we can use the hydropower to generate, to fill that gap uh, between those, those low times of wind. Uh, so this has, been, uh, this has been practiced in many countries and ha has been uh, proved to be effective. So uh, while this is some of the challenges, we can see a huge opportunity to, in the Southern Africa region, which is uh, there is a regional hydropower and storage facilities uh, in Zambezi River Basin, for example, which could serve as, as a battery. Uh, and this huge capacity of wind uh, is also an opportunity. Uh, and there's also a, a hydropower capacity in Zambezi Basin. So a perfect uh, co coordination could make this, uh, this intermittent resource more usable into, uh, into the system. So this was the whole idea of the uh, this research activity, trying to see if this regional coordination of wind hydro hydropower can give rise to a better reliability of this intermittent uh, resource. So uh, the question, these were the four, more, uh, the four questions that we were trying to address in the research. Uh, the first one, obviously, is can a regional coordinated operation uh, of this wind and hydro, or solar and hydro, result in a better penetration of, uh, or a better utilization of this wind resource in the system. Uh, assuming um, no constraint in the system or a perfect coordination in terms of transmission, uh, uh, in terms of transmission and communication between the different facilities, how should we operate this reservoir so that to get the maximum benefit out of this wind re uh, intermittent resource? And what will this implication be on the demand supply sites from both Zambezi, the countries sharing the Zambezi River Basin and, and South Africa? And also finally, what uh, we try to pinpoint the critical constraint in the system. Uh, like for example, uh, if adding more storage in the system could uh, give rise to better utilization of wind, or if adding more flexibility to, to, to the existing facilities, for example, for core power plants, could give rise to uh, uh, higher penetration, or, or uh, pumped storage in which we pump the water back to the reservoirs could give rise. So we try to look at this, uh, the, these uh, parameters also in the, in the study. So going to the main elements, uh, so the input data that we used is a perfect soap foresight wind generation, which means we 
uh, beforehand we have the generating pattern of wind. So this was taken from a research conducted by uh, UML, I think in 2010, uh, in early time step. We also made use of the 2010 uh, energy, actual energy demand from, uh, from ESCOM. We got that from ESCOM. Uh, so those were our input data. Uh, we had to utilize a water resources model to try and uh, simulate how the reservoirs uh, are storing water and releasing water and how the, the hydropower starts generating energy. So for that, we implemented a reservoir, uh, a water resources system model that runs on hourly time step, which is governed by policy and then policy constraint. By policy constraint, uh, I'm, I'm talking about like environmental constraints, for example, how, how we can fluctuate or how, how, we, how we can release downstream so that uh, it is within the, the ecological limit that was set by the policy. The non-policy constraints are uh, like reservoir storage or water resource availability uh, as guided by the, the hydrology of the system. This is a priority-based water allocation model, which also takes uh, other demands like environmental flow requirement and irrigation water requirement into a consideration. So this uh, full water resource model does the water allocation to the, to the different demand in the system and also uh, generates hydropower. The second model that we implemented was a power interconnection model. This is a single node simple power balance model that uh, looks at uh, available power and the demand and tries to match those two. Uh, the fourth tool that we implemented was a global optimization model that tries to uh, that tries to wrap this water resource and power interconnection model and trying to come up with uh, an optimum uh, operating policy for each reservoirs in 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 Zambezi uh, to come up with an optimum allocation policy spatially, which means optimum between the different reservoirs and the different power supplies, and also uh, optimum allocation across overall the time step by the, considering the different variability in the system, the different seasonal variability in the system, particularly in, in water resource availability. Uh, so this is a schematic of what uh, the components that I just, I just talked about. So this is the I'm not going to go into detail, but this is the water resources model, the, the different dams uh, generating hydropower, uh, hydro, hydropower, their respective hydropower demand uh, in Zambezi. And this is, these are the different um, energy sources in, 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 in South Africa. So this is the interconnection model in which they generated far power from, from Zambezi, all the hydropower from Zambezi will be pulled in together with the wind and we will have uh, a combined wind hydro uh, generation here that will be distributed back to the Zambezi demand and to South Africa demand. So um, we are looking at uh, something like this. We are expecting something like this. So the blue line is the hydropower generation and the, wind, the, the, the green line is the wind uh, the exogenous wind input. So the wind is going to fluctuate, but we are expecting the hydropowers to kick in and start generating whenever the wind uh, energy goes down. So overall keeping the, uh, the, the total generation uh, stable. <coughs> uh, all right, so these are the results that we obtained. Uh, this chart here is the, the wind, okay, <laughs> try to throw up. Uh, the wind generation uh, minus the, the hydropower demand that's taken out from Zambezi. Initially, it will be fluctuating. The, that's the red uh, chart is the, the fluctuation intermittent data. Uh, the, this is the output from the model, which is more rectified, more stable, uh, and highly reliable uh, energy uh, form of energy. So if you remember the original power duration curve that I displayed, which is this dotted line, um, now when we plot another duration curve to overlay, to look at what the impact is gonna be, we can see that we can achieve higher reliability, higher uh, power capacity at higher reliability. Uh, we are getting an improvement uh, like 4,500 megawatt watt power, which is equivalent to Inga 3 uh, hydropower dam, uh, which, is a, which is a huge benefit. 
Uh, also, this is for South Africa. For Zambezi, there's also, uh, initially this was not the target, but with this byproduct plus that was obtained, uh, the, it's also uh, making the system of Zambezi, uh, the system of hydropower in Zambezi more reliable. Initially in the original configuration, there were slightly unmet demand uh, of uh, hydropower in, in, in Zambezi. However, with this configuration, we are able to completely meet the demand in, in, in Zambezi, which is uh, plus plus. Uh, so, uh, looking at the implication of demand supply in South Africa, th these charts compare the reference case scenario in which uh, wind, uh, the wind power will still be part of the system, but uh, the load following and the fluctuation is going to be uh, carried out by the coal power plants, and coal power plants are not that flexible. And this is the new configuration, or uh, this the new operation, which uh, the wind hydro operation, giving rise to a better penetration of the system. So that's why I said initially uh, the 25 percent of penetration that has been uh, said by uh, government might be too optimistic, unless uh, there is some kind of regional coordination in which at least we could go, we could come close to uh, 20 percent of, of uh, generation. Other qualitative results that we, that we observed is that uh, since uh, some of the load following is going to be done by the hydropower plants, we are operating, we will be operating our coal power plants uh, relatively more in, in more steady manner. So this means two things. One is efficient utilization of uh, resource which, because when we make the, power, the coal power plants to fluctuate, uh, rapidly we are consuming more resource and the, it's less efficient. Uh, so uh, the more stable they are, the more efficient the resource utilization is going to be. And also better life of the facility, which means the more stable we are operating them, the better uh, elongated life the coal power plants will have. <clears throat> so to uh, wrap up, these are some of the summary results that we obtained. The additional, at 90% reliable, we are, we are able to find 4,500, close to 4,500 megawatt hour, which is uh, a huge improvement over the 1,000 megawatt hour at 90% of reliability. Uh, based on this new configuration of coordinated regional operation, we could achieve around 18.7% of penetration. And it's also making the existing system in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Zambezi more more reliable, so we are looking at a win-win situation at both ends, and also less cycling requirement, which is a uh, good thing for the coal power plants. Uh, so these are my two concluding remarks. So uh, it, regional cooperation uh, is not only uh, it's 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 very important to achieve also national goals in addition to achieving regional win-win situations in which both parties can benefit. Therefore, this coordinated operation should come into a picture both at planning of uh, stage as, as well as during implementation since now countries are uh, engaged more in, into developing these renewable resources. Uh, with that, I come to end of my presentation. Look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.